Hello and welcome. I'm David Greenberg, my website freedomvibe.arts. I am a video content creator and publisher, and I'm a teacher of natural law. Today is Sunday, April 23rd, 2023, and I have a very special presentation for you today. I'm calling it Understanding Human Nature. And the subtitle is Demystifying Ourselves. And that is exactly what we're going to do today. Now, just before we get into the body of the material for today's presentation, I want to share with you a few pointers and ideas that I think will help you get the most out of this presentation. And in fact, out of any of my presentations. And that is as follows. I'd like to clarify that what I'm going to share today is not just my opinion. This is definitely not my truth, which is actually a nonsense term because truth is objective. This is also not conjecture. Having said all that, I will be sharing some of my perspectives and opinions as we go through this. However, what I'm going to be sharing today is actual knowledge that you can acquire. And it's actually very important knowledge, as we're going to see as we go through this presentation. Now, this knowledge is all in the public domain. There's nothing here that you couldn't discover for yourself. I've simply taken the time to compile it together in this presentation to make it easier for you to learn this. It is going to take time, however, to do that, and you'll need to pay attention. And so I want to invite you to invest those two true spiritual currencies of time and attention and really just invest the hour plus it's going to take to go through the entire presentation. It will be worth it. I also want to invite you to be highly teachable. What does it mean to be highly teachable? Teachability is on a bell curve where on one extreme you have rigid, rigid skepticism where you just reject ideas outright if they don't resonate or if they sound unusual, something that you're not, you haven't heard before. On the other side, you have extreme naivete, where people are so naive, so open-minded that they literally will believe anything they're told. I want to encourage you to not be on the extremes of that bell curve, but rather be in the middle. In other words, maintain a certain level of skepticism. Yes, don't automatically believe what you're told, but also don't automatically reject it. Simply entertain these ideas and then you can put them to the test in your own life, just as I have, to validate that they're actually true. If you take that stance, you're going to get the most out of this presentation and really any new knowledge, any new information that you may receive. You may find it helpful to use the Trivium. And if you're not familiar with the Trivium, I want to highly, highly encourage you to go check it out. I did make a video about it myself. You can also do further research on the matter. And finally, I just wanted to remind you that you have free will so you can definitely ignore or reject this information however you do that at your own risk because i'm here to tell you this is really important information and so i encourage you to take a look why am i doing this why this presentation see the thing is we've been lied to about human nature for a very long time in fact, we've been lied to about a lot of important knowledge and information for a very long time, but specifically human nature. And so this presentation that I've created, one of the main goals is to help level the playing field between those who already know it and those who are now have the chance to learn this. So for you, the benefit is you're going to begin to gain back a clear recognition of and a clear understanding of your infinite value as a human being, which also means that you will be able to claim, maybe for the first time, or reclaim your natural and inherent sovereignty. What happens is, as more people together, as more of us together gain an understanding of this knowledge, we actually now have the ability to really, really affect change in the world, positive change to end suffering, to end slavery, to create more freedom, to create more joy, more possibility. It's really incredible what we can do when we start to unlock this level. 
But in the end, all I can do is show up here and share with you what I know already in the hopes that I can persuade you to take a look and that you can bring it under consideration because only you can discover the truth for yourself. I'd also like to give a special shout out and a warm thank you and appreciation to today's sponsor, Im Licht, which means in the light. Jonathan Franzel is a fellow anarchist and abolitionist. He is also teaching natural law and occult knowledge, and he's doing it in German and English, German being his native tongue. In fact, Jonathan has already translated two of my other presentations. One is called Knowing Your Rights, and the other is called Should You Pay Taxes? So if you are a native German speaker, or if you like to learn more of these principles in German, I want to invite you to check out Jonathan's work Definitely follow him on YouTube and elsewhere. I'm going to provide links in the description of this video so you can find his work. And just thank you again, Jonathan. I appreciate you. Before we can tackle the main topic of today's presentation, it's going to be really helpful if we can have a better understanding of what we mean by the nature of a thing. So what exactly does that mean to talk about the nature of a thing? The word nature in English is derived from an ancient Egyptian word that was written in hieroglyphics that is pronounced nature. So almost exactly as it is in English. It's an Egyptian word for God, for a deity, or for a divine object. So when we combine nature with the suffix al, then we get of or from God, of spirit, spiritual, or natural. So we can say that something that is natural is actually something that is spiritual, coming from the spirit world. It is inherent, and specifically it is not artificial, meaning it is not, has not been created by human beings or by any mortal being. So in summary, the nature of a thing is its inherent or innate characteristics. It's what all things of the same type have in common. It's how it functions, how it operates. It explains which characteristics are immutable, meaning which cannot be changed and which can be changed. And we can also talk about both physical and psychological or mental characteristics or properties. So human nature is a set of characteristics, a set of properties, if you will, that we all have as human beings. And these are considered to be part of, to help define what it means to be human. Now, before we get into basically de-occulting or revealing what human nature actually is, it's going to be important to understand and gain a little bit of perspective on how human nature is presented in pop culture. Because, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have been lied to a lot. And pop culture is the main vehicle through which these lies and deceptions are propagated, both about human nature, but also about many important topics. So let's dive in a little bit and understand what it, what human nature, how human nature is portrayed in pop culture. So many people will have heard the song by Michael Jackson called Human Nature. You probably have heard it any number of times because it's gotten a lot of, just like a lot of pop songs, it's gotten a lot of airplay on the radio and in general. What I'd like to invite you to do is go back and actually read the lyrics to this song. Sometimes, I would say often, it's easier to understand the lyrics when you actually read them because when you listen to the song, yes, you can get it, but it's different, different. You, you definitely wanna go read the lyrics. And I, I wanna invite you to consider what, what you get out of reading the lyrics. What do, you, what do you get out of it? 
see when i read the lyrics i saw that basically the messages behind the song could be interpreted as for example human behavior is very mysterious it's difficult or impossible to understand it's fixed in many ways and it's inexplicable again hard or impo nearly impossible to really really understand it this is important because a song like this that's heard over and over and over again and going into the subconscious that's exactly the message that's being carried over to millions if not billions of people another example in pop culture which is arguably even older is the whole nature versus nurture debate this is a dialectic a dialectic is basically a false choice a, a choice that really isn't a choice and dialectics are very very common as a way as a form of deception and we'll be mentioning a few others in this presentation but the nature versus nurture is a great example of a dialectic the way the dialectic works is you have people on the one hand saying the way humans behave is is almost entirely driven by nature meaning our genetics our inherent traits and on the other side you have those who say it's almost entirely our environment and has very little to do with nature so you have these kind of two polarized extremes whereas the truth in as it is in almost every case is somewhere in the middle in pop culture i would say not only popular culture but in culture going back in time a long time we have this whole notion of original sin coming from certain christian religious traditions and this is basically the idea that humans are born in sin we're born fallen meaning we are already tending to evil we are already tending to be basically bad even as we're born and therefore all we can do is just suppress our evil nature imagine what that does to the psychology to believe your entire life that you're evil by nature and the best that you can do is to hold back that evil what it, what does that actually do to this to the human psyche when you have that belief now interestingly enough on the other extreme we have new age thinking which was introduced more recently and this in many cases goes to the other extreme many schools of new age thinking believe the opposite they believe that humans are only good by nature and that evil is just a perspective it's maybe just a misunderstanding right and it's all for our benefit it's really going to the other extreme and that makes it also a dialectic because people tend to choose one or the other i did some research about human nature and pop culture and one article that came up almost at the top of the search results said that said the following it said that human nature consists of seven traits sorry six traits and they are laziness greed ambition self-interest ignorance and vanity that's right just just think about that for a minute that this is the pinnacle of understanding human nature laziness greed ambition self-interest ignorance and vanity again what do you think some what is the psychology going to be inside a person who thinks that this is the height of understanding our nature as human beings now human nature as a concept is largely rejected by postmodern thinking postmodern thinking and all of the derivatives of postmodernism those schools of thought they don't even consider that there is an inherent nature it's all chaos it's all situational we're only human this is a phrase that pro that you have almost certainly heard at least once in your life and probably many many times we're only human or i'm only human i think there's even a song by the human league that's that's either the name of the song or it's in the lyrics what does that imply we're only human on the word only is important here it implies or suggests that we are weak fallible prone to error or sin again that same concept flawed limited or of low value 
One last example. There is a pop culture group, a hip hop group, whose name is Naughty by Nature. There it is, right in the name of the group, Naughty by Nature. But what's the implication? Again, the implication is by nature we are naughty, meaning we tend to be harmful, we tend to do the wrong things, we tend to be evil, depending on how you want to interpret. Right there in the, ty right there in the name of the group. So just to summarize how mainstream culture portrays human nature. There is no consensus. There's no objective truth that we can come to know about it. It can't be known or agreed upon. Instead, we have these dialectics. We have these counterpoints where people tend to polarize and believe either one or the other. Either we're good by nature or we're evil, or we don't have a nature at all. Either we're empowered or we're weak, or there's no way to know. Another very important point here is that human nature in popular culture is indistinguishable from the human condition. They are conflated. Basically, we're conflating cause and effect. So we're looking at the current condition of humanity, the current state of, of humanity, and we're calling that human nature, which is completely wrong, and it's a misunderstanding of the principle of cause and effect, which of course is one of the occult principles from most notably recognized from the hermetic traditions, the seven hermetic principles. But it is a core principle of natural law. And of course, it's never talked about at all in mainstream culture. Finally, one of the main ways in which humanity is portrayed in mainstream culture is that we are violent by nature. We are violent by nature and therefore we must be policed and controlled and regulated by law, law and authority, man's law, not natural law. The long and the short of it is that popular culture is telling us a lie. It's been socially engineered to specifically obfuscate the truth about human nature. So what we're gonna do for the balance of this presentation is we are going to dive in to understand the true nature of, hum of human beings from an occult sciences perspective. Now, I know there's going to be at least some people coming on to this presentation that when I say the occult or occult sciences, they're gonna, their mind's going to immediately go to thinking that I'm talking about something evil, which is completely incorrect. So therefore, what I would like to do is provide a very brief recap of what the occult is. And I know this will be review for some people, so just hang in there. So the word occult in English comes from the Latin occultare. The Latin verb occultare means to hide or to conceal from the eyes. So the occult, in fact, refers to a body of science. It's actually a very large body of science and a very ancient knowledge set and understanding that falls under two different domains. The, what we can call the lesser and greater arcana or the inner and outer domains. So the inner domain refers to a better understanding of the human psyche, of our inner world, human psychology, how we work, our wants, our, our deepest wants, fears and desires, how we're motivated, how we can be motivated, how we can learn and so forth. And the other body of science in the occult deals with reality as a whole, natural law, the nature of reality, how reality is, is created, how reality is generated, how it works, not just from the physical sciences perspective, things like gravity, electromagnetism, and so forth, but also from the spiritual laws which are operating in the mental realm, the, or what has been called the causal plane. Now, why is it called the occult? We call it the occult because for most of human history, most of recorded history, and probably even well before that, it has been, this knowledge has been intentionally hidden by certain individuals and certain groups. And there are many motivations for hiding it, but one of the main motivations is to, is to basically create a power differential so that certain individuals can 
but in knowing knowledge that most people don't know, they can wield power over others. And that is essentially how modern civilization has been built. Now, knowledge can't actually be hidden physically. In today's post-apocalyptic world, where pretty much all knowledge has been revealed and can be readily accessed via the internet, then this knowledge can't truly be hidden. The way it's hidden is by using the same knowledge of psychology against us. And that includes techniques, time-tested techniques, religion, obfuscation, misdirection, or look over here instead of over here where the real knowledge is, dissuasion, induction of fear, and distraction. It's really important to understand that all knowledge is neutral. Knowledge is neither good nor evil. This is a big mistake that a lot of people make, and even I've made this mistake in the past, is to think that knowledge itself can either be good or evil. That is not true. Knowledge is just pure potential. All knowledge is neutral. It's only what we do with it, how we act on it, that generates good or evil as a result. So what we're going to explore together for the remainder of this presentation are six attributes or aspects of human nature that we, could, we can agree are the most important to understand and gaining an understanding of these six will provide a very, very solid foundation upon which to continue to learn and grow and to create better outcomes together in this world. So the six that we're going to explore together are holistic intelligence, free will, programmability, self-reflection, conscience, and creativity. I'm going to propose to use a specific methodology in this presentation as follows. For each of these attributes, I want to dive in a bit and provide as much of an explanation as I can to really understand the essence and the substance of that particular aspect in some detail. I'm also going to share anecdotes. I'm going to share briefly from my own life how my knowledge of or ignorance of these attributes contributed to the trajectory of my own life, and you may see some parallels in your life as well. We're also going to take a step back and consider the meaning and significance of each and I'm going to invite you in your own time to really contemplate and go deeper into them through your own self-study. And we're going to look at positive examples, meaning from a point of knowledge and empowerment, knowledge, understanding, and right action, how can we use a, our better understanding of these attributes to really improve our own lives and improve the world? And I'm also going to give specific examples of how the whom I call the dark occultists, use this against us. The dark occultists are this very small minority of individuals in the world who already know this. They already know this information deeply. In fact, some of them, maybe even many of them, know them more deeply than I do. And they certainly know it more deeply than most people. And they specifically use it against, use that knowledge against us, against humanity, via the power differential created by that knowledge gap. Okay, so we're going to look at specifically how they're doing that so that we can start to take back our power. We're also going to consider the relationships between these traits, how they basically stack on each other. And finally, I'm going to give you some homework assignments so that you can really go deep and deepen your understanding of each. Great. So now we're ready to dive in and tackle the first of these principles, the first of these traits, which is holistic intelligence. So what is holistic intelligence? Well, intelligence is already holistic. What do I mean by that? It's right in the word. Intelligence is intelle plus gents. Intelle refers to the intellect. This refers to logic, reason, language, rational thoughts, organized thoughts, structure, 
most people will immediately recognize that this type of thinking is generally associated with the left hemisphere of the neocortex of the human brain. On the other side, you have gens, which comes from the Latin genesis or genere. That means to create, to make, genere, to generate. This refers to things like intuition, imagination, creative thinking, common sense, emotion. And of course, most people will recognize that it is associated with the right hemisphere of the neocortex. Intelligence, putting these together, is balance and harmony. It's balance and harmony between intellect and intuition. So holistic intelligence, that term is actually redundant. And intelligence, what it does is it unlocks greater levels of consciousness. It enables higher levels of consciousness than would be otherwise possible. Now here's the good news. All human beings are gifted with the capacity for holistic intelligence. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. And I also have to point out that there is one notable exception that we'll need to talk about. Proportionally, it's a very small percentage of us, but it still needs to be mentioned. But because it's such a small percentage, for all intents and purposes, we can say that all human beings are gifted with the capacity for holistic intelligence. How does this manifest in our lives? Well, one of the ways is through conscience and morality, meaning knowing the difference between right and wrong action and, for example, doing the right thing even when it's difficult. Of course, we're going to talk more about conscience and morality as we get deeper into this presentation. Intelligence also allows us to create all these amazing forms of higher art and music and theater and film and so forth. It allows us to invent and to embark on creative endeavors to solve complicated and complex problems, to build these amazing communities and societies where many people live together in harmony, even though they are individuals, each with their own, we could say, universe within, their own wants and needs and needs and desires, their own thoughts and perspectives. And yet we're able to cohabit in peace and harmony because of this holistic intelligence, among other things. It is also what allows us to develop and step into our role as stewards of this planet and its other inhabitants meaning we don't own the planet, we don't own the animals, we're not their masters or rulers, but we can be their stewards. As beings with holistic intelligence, we can lead, we can care for, we can tend to our environment. We can take better care of it and make sure it's the best place possible. It also allows us to turn inward and improve ourselves to cultivate through personal development to cultivate better versions of ourselves, to improve within. We'll talk more about that as well in this presentation. It allows us to reconnect with the spirit. It allows us to find divinity within us, our, to basically have our own spirituality, our inner connection to God and creation and the higher self. Now, I mentioned that there is one notable exception that we have to call out as far as the capacity for holistic intelligence. And that is psychopathy. This artwork comes from a presentation that I did more than a year ago on the topic. So if you want to dive in a bit more and understand what is psychopathy, I want to encourage you to go check that video out. Just by way of brief recap, the word psychopathy comes from the Greek psyche and pathos, together meaning a disease, an illness, or a suffering of the mind. And we have this notion of primary psychopaths. These are people who are born psychopathic. They are born with an incapacitated or defective limbic brain or mammalian brain, the result of which is that they are incapable of experiencing fear and love and all the range of the emotions that we normally feel in our bodies. 
Now, to be fair, this is a very small percentage. It's probably less than 1% of the human population. There is a little bit of dispute over exactly how many it is, and we probably don't know for sure. But based on the research I've done, it's a very, very small percentage. And what psychopaths do is because they lack emotion and the ability to feel the emotions, they're basically relating to the world through the intellect alone. Everything is intellectual. They can mimic emotion, and they often do that to fit in, but they're not truly feeling emotions like you and I. And that can be really hard for people to understand if, you ha if you're not a psychopath. And unfortunately for them, it means that they are incapable physically of holistic intelligence. It also means that they're, that they're not truly human in the way that you and I are. Now, just to clarify that last point, I'm not saying that they don't have a right to exist. They certainly do. But they are not like you and I. There is a difference. And it is important for us to understand this difference. Being a small percentage, most people will not be affected by this. And chances are good that if you who's watching this are not a psychopath, at least not a born psychopath. We can take on psychopathy secondarily in life. And I'll talk a little more about that as we go through the presentation. Through intelligence, holistic intelligence, this unlocks our ability to gain higher levels of consciousness. It helps us to to recognize more deeper meanings and patterns in reality, and also to recognize the same within ourselves. So this is really a foundational attribute of what it means to be human. I did promise that I'd share a little bit about my own journey and in terms of, the, of each of these attributes. So let me share really briefly how this has played out in my own life. And I think this photo of me from about eight years ago really demonstrates where I was at that time. You can, you can pretty much see it on my face. For most of my life, I was left brain dominant. I was almost exclusively in my left brain and my right brain or my intuition, my common sense, that kind of intelligence was largely suppressed. I was, I was born with those capabilities and I've since been able to recover that, but for most of my life, to be perfectly honest, I was ignoring and suppressing that. And this led me to specifically suffer a lot in my life, a lot of suffering on multiple dimensions. I struggled with health. I struggled with relationships. I struggled with finances. I even struggled to, to be a good person with morality and in other dimensions as well. But because I always had that ability, because I had the capacity and I never completely lost it, I was through my life's path, through certain choices that I made later in life, I was able to start to take a path down to recovery, to create more balance in my life. And in fact, those of you who follow my work know that I recently, just this year, started to write songs and sing. And that is an expression of the unfolding of my own holistic intelligence and specifically more of the nurturing, intuitive and creative side of me. And even though I literally went through more than 50 years without doing that, I reached a point in my life where I knew I wanted to continue to cultivate that. And so that allowed me to explore that. And I'll be talking more about that. Of course, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but I'll talk more about that as well as we get into the presentation. Awesome. Now we're ready to talk about the second attribute of human nature, which is free will. Free will is, in fact, a gift from creation, just like all of these attributes that we have. And it is really, really an amazing gift. It is our ability, our inherent ability to choose each and every of our actions and our behaviors. It's really amazing. Free will has been likened to what we can call the random or non-deterministic aspect of reality. See, reality has both a random component and a deterministic component. We'll talk more about that as well, but this is another example of a dialectic you may recognize where 
on one side you have people who think that it's all random, only random. There is no determinism. And on the other extreme, it's all pre preordained or predetermined, and there is no free will. Again, those are false choices. The truth is in the middle, and free will is basically the random component. It's random because looking outside, we can never truly, truly predict the behavior of any human being before they actually act. Even though we can take educated guesses, we can't truly know what they're going to do until they actually do it. And you know that to be true for yourself as well. Even when we're coerced, even when we're threatened, we still have the choice. And in fact, only you can decide what to do in any given situation. If we didn't have free will, we would basically be like puppets. We, could, we would have no capacity to actually learn and grow and evolve. We would be fixed. We could only be influenced or programmed from out the outside, like a machine, like technology, like artificial intelligence. We wouldn't be able to basically be the master of ourselves and determine our own life path. It would not be possible to do that. I want to invite you to really contemplate just how powerful and important, how much of a gift this is, that, it, that free will allows us, it is exactly what allows us to grow. It is what allows us to learn and grow, sometimes even by making mistakes, because we get to make the choice. And then we get to face the inevitable consequences of the choices we make. Now, natural law is the deterministic complement to free will. And I'm not going to talk a lot about natural law, except in context here today. Obviously, I'm going to mention it when relevant. If you want to go deeper into an understanding of natural law, I want to invite you to explore all of the content that I publish on my website. And you can definitely go deeper. But just for the purposes of this conversation, you can think of natural law as like a giant is is reality is a giant mirror and basically what it's doing is when we make choices of behavior through our free will we get consequences and those consequences are designed to facilitate and maximize our learning and our growth so let's talk a little bit about how this predator class basically uses our free will against us or more specifically they use their superior understanding of free will and how it works against us through our own ignorance of it. See, the thing is, the reason why I call them dark occultists is they are occultists. And as occultists, they already know and understand that we have free will. They know that free will can never actually be taken away from us. There's no way to actually physically remove free will. So in order to enslave us, they need to actually get us to consent to being slaves. And in some cases to be the slave drivers, like the sheepdog, the, or what some people call the house slaves. So they have to get us to consent. This is, this is the big trick. And there's a lot of ways that they do this, but one of the biggest ways is by providing false choices, providing choices that are illusory. One of the most common examples is the lesser of two evils. We've all heard this expression before, the lesser of two evils. This is actually based on a lie because we never, we should never choose evil, whether greater or lesser. But by making us think that we, that it is the right thing to do to choose the lesser of two evils, we end up choosing that which seems lesser, but is actually still wrong and evil. It's still harmful. It's still enslaving us, taking away freedom. So really, we need to choose our own slavery. That's, that's the long and short of it. And most people do that by remaining ignorant. Now, I'm, I'm oversimplifying in a way because I'm conveying something that's been going on for tens of thousands of years, if not longer, right up to the present day, and I'm encapsulating it in one slide. So, you know, I'm obviously going to leave out some detail. But if you want to have kind of a big picture understanding of how free will is weaponized, 
that's really it. It's, it is really that simple. Because of our ignorance of, of the fact that we do have free will and due to being duped, tricked, and deceived, and lied to, and basically not respecting our own free will, we choose to be slaves. We choose to be harmed. We choose to live in a world based on violence and coercion. That's, that's the long and short of it. Great. So now I want to offer you up a homework assignment that's going to help you to deepen your own understanding of free will. And that is as follows. For the next 24 hours, and it could be longer, I would say the minimum 24 hours, I want you to start to become more consciously aware of your free will in action. I want you to be aware that you are making the choice every time you act. And I want to invite you to add a slight pause in between those actions. Add a slight pause before you act so you can bring even more awareness to it. And through that process, as you start to bring more conscious awareness to your choices, make a commitment to yourself to make better choices. Consider the consequences of your actions. Consider what, what can happen, what may happen as a result of the choices you make. Notice that you cannot control those consequences, but you can always choose the action itself. I'd like to invite you to do something that I've done, which is to cultivate a sense of gratitude for this absolutely amazing gift that we have. See, part of the problem is that we don't value and appreciate these gifts that we've been given from creation. So I'd like to invite you to do that. Really take a minute to, to appreciate and acknowledge that you've been gifted with free will. And that's the enabler. That's what empowers you to always make the choice. So go ahead and do that homework assignment. If you want to do that now or come back to the video, that's great. Um, and see what you can cultivate. And I'd love for you to share those of you who do do the homework, I'd love for you to come back to the video and share with everyone what your experience was because that's going to help other people in their own growth. Awesome. So now we are ready to tackle the third aspect of human nature, which is programmability. Something that is perhaps less understood even than free will and something that is some in some ways maybe as important if not more important than free will in terms of understanding why the world is the way it is why we suffer and what we can do to make changes let's talk about the programmable nature of human beings our minds can be programmed we are programmable like a computer we are not computers it's not to say that we are equivalent to computers but we are like a computer in the sense that we we can be programmed and the programming can basically consist of beliefs or belief systems thought patterns and habits among others how are we programmed we're programmed through archetypal symbols and language these are two of the main ways that we are programmed. Most people understand language, but maybe symbols are under less understood. As students and initiates of occult knowledge, we go deep into symbology and we start to understand that there are archetypal symbols that we all understand at a very ba basic level in our consciousness, even when our conscious mind isn't aware of them. And we start to pay more attention to those symbols and their meaning. Violence and trauma increase our susceptibility to programming. If you've ever experienced violence, if you've ever experienced trauma and observed how it changed your own behavior, then you probably have a firsthand recognition of this. But we can see it very clearly through the pattern of history and through the behavior of others. And in order to get by in life, our programming informs our behavior to a great extent. Some, some researchers have claimed or have stated that it could be well over 90% of our behaviors are automated by some kind of programming in our subconscious. And that may or may not be true. I'm, I would certainly think that it would be at least 75 to 
certainly more in certain circumstances. And um, that would be necessary, as we'll see, because our conscious mind would be overwhelmed if we had to consciously act upon everything in our environment. Now, one of the interesting aspects is that programs can be added or removed. So we can be deprogrammed. You've probably heard of this. Someone who leaves a cult, you may have heard about deprogramming from a cult or, or coming out of a religion. That's exactly what's happening. Removing habits is also a form of deprogramming or reprogramming. It's also really, really important to understand that young children are the most susceptible to external programming. They are the most susceptible. And as stewards of the children, we have a moral duty to protect them, something that we haven't been doing, unfortunately. And the dark occultists, they know this, and they particularly target children, especially under the age of five. It turns out that we can be programmed to be predominantly good, and we can pro be programmed to be pre predominantly evil. And this is part of, part of, explains partly why some people think people are good, because some people are, and others are evil, because we can be programmed either way or within the range of that. We also have the ability to accept or reject programming based on our free will, based on our consciousness. When we become consciously aware of, first of all, the fact that we are programmable, but then the programs themselves, then we start to intercede consciously on our own behalf, on the behalf of others, of our children, and we start to accept or reject the programming accordingly. Now, programming has many benefits. It's, it's not only a negative thing. It's not, it's uh, like almost any concept in reality, there is a positive and negative interpretation. So on the positive side, Beneficial programming allows us to cultivate self-esteem and self-worth. It allows us to activate higher levels of consciousness and higher faculties, such as willpower and courage. It's the backbone of allowing us to achieve big goals and act with purpose. It's what allows us to learn and acquire new knowledge and skills. We can actually design ourselves. We can design our personality. We can create our state of being, our, our, the, the, the immediate circumstances that we find ourselves in. We get to master complex skills and abilities, like piloting a plane, like driving a car, or perform, performing music, managing complex organizations. Imagine having to pilot a plane or even drive a car, something that probably almost certainly you've done in your life. And imagine having to be consciously aware, just like you were when you learned how to drive all the time. Be overwhelming. It would be infeasible for you to do that. It would be exhausting. So programming has a good side. It allows us to imprint on our minds, on our subconscious, things that allow us to operate in ways that we wouldn't be able to if we weren't able to do that. And that allows us to, for example, drive while having sometimes very deep and uh, deep thoughts and maybe even about completely unrelated subjects. Of course, there is a dark side to programming. And if we're going to take on this knowledge and really understand it, we need to see both sides. The dark side of programming is very active in the world today, and we can see it manifested in many things. Television is one of the best examples of programming. In fact, it's called television programming for a reason. Television is tell a vision because what it's doing is it's telling us, here's how you should see the world. Here sh here's what your vision of reality should be. Tell a vision. Hypnosis. Hypnosis can be used for good, but it can be used to insert knowledge gnosis and behaviors and resulting behaviors under knowledge hypognosis meaning it's put in subconsciously below the conscious awareness again that can be used for good but it can also be used manipulatively public school education in quotes 
because it's really nothing of the kind. It's really indoctrination. And it's specifically programming, it's specifically designed to program obedience and authority. Obedience to authority. That is the purpose of that indoctrination. We've already talked about pop culture, and pop culture programs us in many different ways and to have many different thoughts and beliefs through the different media, film, television, and music, among others. Not to mention the mainstream news. And we can thank those who are lying for a paycheck every single day as they show up to tell us a vision in the mainstream media news. We can talk about manipulation of language. I'm going to say the following words and I want you to notice how they affect you. Everybody will be different, but everybody will be affected some way or another by these words. Conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theorist. Terrorist. Racism. Nigger. Slavery. Holocaust. Anti-Semitism. Just take a minute to notice how those words affected you and you'll have some insights into how they're being used to program you to think certain ways and to behave in certain ways. And that's the mind control. Religion. Religion is likely the oldest and most common way of programming. And in fact, the dark occultists themselves are religionists. They have a religion of their own. The famous researcher Bill Cooper called it Mystery Babylon. It's been called the old religion. It's been called Satanism, dark Luciferianism, and other names. But religions in general, even the astro-theological religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are also forms of religion. And there are modern forms of religion as well. The belief in authority is a religion. Religion comes from the Latin religare. The ver it's a verb, it's a compound verb that's composed of a prefix, re, with a verb antecedent, ligare. Ligare means to tie or to bind. And when you combine it with re, it means to tie back, to bind tightly, or to thwart from forward progress. Essentially, religion is a box for consciousness. And what that means is it creates a limiter that says you're allowed to think within these boundaries. You're allowed to think and believe these things, but anything outside of that, you don't go there. That's religion. Sexual ritual abuse, which is part of the dark occult, particularly in childhood, is a way to induce trauma. Remember, we talked about trauma as a facilitator of programming. And this is done ritualistically because when you can fracture the consciousness of an individual and start to create what are called alters, you can literally program people to have different personalities that don't even know about each other. And that's because the mind, when it is deeply traumatized, will, will isolate, will wall off the traumatic memories. So in the extreme, it starts to create alters. This is a very well-documented process. And if you want to look more into it, I encourage you to look into the works of Jay Parker, Kathy O'Brien, Catherine Waters, and Fritz Springmeier, among, among others. Chaos sorcery is a, another form of dark programming that happens on a massive scale. This is when a massive ritual is performed that is designed to principally put a large number of people into a state of fear so that they will become more compliant and more obedient as they attempt to feel safe again. 9-11 is probably the most well-known example of chaos sorcery in recent times, but any false flag event, any engineer, socially engineered event or occurrence could be potentially chaos sorcery. The pandemic, scamdemic of the last three years or so was also a form of chaos sorcery of a different kind. It actually is several different types of chaos sorcery, uh, but unlike September 11th, it didn't all happen in one day, uh, but it actually it happened over a longer period of time. 
and school shootings, mass shootings, particularly in the United States, which is practically the only country where these events occur, that should give you a clue to the fact that they are engineered, is another example of dark programming. Again, to put people into fear and to get them to believe certain things so they act and behave in a certain way. So what are the effects of mind control? Mind control is, is the term referring to external programming for the purposes of controlling the behavior of an individual. So what mind control is actually doing is it's placing the mind and the brain in a state of imbalance, usually pushing it towards left brain or right brain, brain dominance. And this chart on the left, which comes from Mark Passio's work, is a good example of this. And it creates certain behaviors on either side. And the dark occultists, they want, they need both for their systems, for their schemes to be successful. They need certain people to act like slaves, and they that would be the right brain dominance. And they need certain people to act like masters. That's the left brain dominance. And if you were to take a PET scan or a scan of someone's the brain activity of an individual who is experiencing this balance, you would literally see darkened areas in the affected part of their brain. It is an actual physical disease. It is a often reversible disease, but it is a physically manifested disease. This can lead to low self-esteem, low self-worth, a failure to stand up for yourself. This is a big aspect of why the world is the way it is, because most people are afraid or lack the courage or the backbone to stand up for themselves and their value. It also leads on the master side to the willingness to inflict violence without thinking about the consequences. It leads to limiting and false beliefs. It leads to the belief in and the acceptance of all forms of external authority, including in particular government and the enforcement of government through policing, through the military. It leads also to mental laziness, even an unwillingness to learn and take on important new knowledge, such as what I'm sharing in today's presentation. Many people will, will not even have made it this far in this presentation because of that mental laziness. Think about that. It leads to anxiety and depression. See, anxiety and depression, they're not just random. They're not just because someone's born with a tendency. They are effects of a cause. They are symptoms of a problem. And while it's not the only reason, mind control can often lead to increased anxiety and depression. And it leads to people being easily controllable and triggered. We've talked about triggering again. Think about those words that I recited in the last slide. But think about how easily someone who is deeply programmed, how they could be triggered and controlled to behave in any number of different ways. Talking about programming and how that's played out in my own life. I did not have parental oversight and guidance during the crucial times of my mental development as a young child definitively and this has consequences my parents did not help me to gain conscious control of my mind and to program me in a way that was going to optimize my ability to learn and grow to be moral and to contribute positively not only in my own life but to the world as a consequence of that, I never developed a moral filter, a behavioral filter. Things were very haphazard. And we could say that the chaos that we see in the world around us, I had mental chaos in my own mind as a result of that. Fortunately, through a series of events, I made the conscious choice to stop watching television in 2004, almost 20 years ago. But not before I had spent more than half of my life watching television. Although I did start making better choices and con more conscious decisions moving forward and specifically on what I was going to put into my own mind. This later led me to quit bad habits like smoking just through activating my will. And then I was also able to deprogram myself from all religion, including and most notably the belief in authority, the belief that someone can actually or does have the right to rule through violence 
Now, in the present, I am a sovereign of my own mind. And I control largely my programming, the programming that I allow in my mind, to a much greater extent than any time in my life. I am not completely immune to external influence, just like you are not and nobody is, because we live in a world where there are still a lot of external programming, harmful programming. So we can never completely escape it as long as it exists. All we can do is minimize our exposure to it by bringing more conscious awareness to it and by making better conscious choices. Now I wanna share with you a homework ass assignment related to programmability so you can deepen your understanding of this aspect of human nature. What I'd like to invite you to do is to sit down and write out several of your beliefs and, and habits, things that you've taken on. Once you've written them down, I'd like you for each of them to go back and see if you can determine where this belief came from. Where did this come from? How did you take this on as a belief? Did you always believe this or did you start believing this at some point in your life? And if it was the latter, how and why? I also want you to examine each belief more closely and ask yourself a few very powerful and important questions about it. Does this belief serve you? Does this habit serve you? Does it serve others and the world around you? Is it perhaps harmful to you personally? Can it lead to harm to others? Is it limiting you? Is it holding you back? Is it constraining your infinite potential? Now, as you go through this exercise, always being honest with yourself, for any beliefs or habits that you discover that you know are objectively wrong, you know they're causing harm, whether to yourself or others or both, I want you to make the conscious decision to remove those beliefs, to replace those habits with their beneficial complement. I also want to invite you to make an effort to actively remove any sources of programming that you deem negative, that you have identified. Television, certain people that you're spending time with that are filling your minds with poison, and so forth. Anything that's reinforcing or repeating these undesirable thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors, I want you to start to distance yourself. Consider distancing yourself from them and see how that could benefit you. Make conscious choices to do that. And even if you're not able to make all the changes at once, just commit to making the changes that you can make. Do the best that you can. And then after making changes, continue to examine the consequences of those changes and the benefits that you may experience in your life as a result of making those changes. I want to take a minute before we start the fourth section, the fourth trait, to just acknowledge you. If you've stayed with me this far, I want to congratulate you because You've demonstrated yourself to be someone who is teachable, someone who is willing to at least make an effort to invest the time and to pay attention in order to gain this new knowledge. So just wanted to acknowledge you. And let's now dive into the fourth characteristic of human nature, which is the ability to look inward, self-reflection or introspection. As human beings, we have this incredible ability to not only observe the world around us and be externally aware of our reality, but we can actually look inward in a similar manner and start to gain an understanding of our own awareness. And this, is, this parallels what I said earlier about the occult, is the occult consists of the inner world and the outer world. So introspection is this amazing ability to look in and not just to observe, but to actually act upon the inner world as a way to reprogram ourselves, as a way to improve our state of being in the world, and therefore to create better outcomes in the world around us. So let's talk a little bit about the nature of self-awareness. 
as I mentioned, it is likened to shining the light inward. And it's basically consists of practices and they go by different names. We've heard of shadow work, for example. I've talked about shadow work on, on this platform any number of times. But basically, we are looking at our ourselves and our own behavior almost as though we were observing ourselves from outside. There's also an inner viewing from within, so it can actually be both. It can be looking as though we were looking inside ourselves and from outside. And that allows us to basically consider the consequences of how we act and behave. What are going to be those consequences? And then based on the choices that we make through our free will, we can then make changes to our personality, our habits, the way we act, so that we can start to change our inner world. That, that's basically uh, manifests as a change in our personality, but then also the way that we act in the world around us. And in fact, this ability is a requirement for being sovereign. This is a requirement for morality. So that's why I wanted to cover this before I got into conscience as the, as the next one coming up, because we need to have this as a foundation. Without it, there is no ability to choose to act morally. There is no ability to own oneself, to be self-sovereign. So that's how important this is as a characteristic of what it means to be a human being. So if we didn't have self-awareness, we would be not much different from many of the animals where we would operate mostly on instinct. And we might have a limited self-awareness. We could say that some animals, especially higher mammals, they definitely do have some level of self-awareness, but we wouldn't have this deeper level of self-awareness that allows us to really, really be the master of ourselves. And we also would never be able to learn or grow from our mistakes because again, we would almost be, we would be like as though we were operating on a program exclusively and that program could not be changed by us. It would have to be externally changed or maybe it wouldn't be changeable at all depending on the circumstance. We would also not really have this true sense of individual identity that is characteristic of being human. And it's very likely that we would just be we would become more of a destructive force because we have all these higher faculties we we have the will to act we have free will we have hot, you know the intellect but if we didn't have this if we didn't activate this self-awareness and self-reflection then we would very likely become like a version of a virus where we or or a cancer where we would just start absorbing and eating and destroying the environment around us without putting ourselves in check so as human beings, we have the capacity to become meta-aware, aware of our awareness, aware of our nature, aware of what we consist of, uh, what our abilities are, our inherent traits. And then we can use that knowledge, that awareness to our advantage to learn, to grow, and to evolve. Now the dark occultists, again, these occultists who use their knowledge of the occult for dark and nefarious purposes, they recognize that a human being who has a high level of self-awareness is more likely to become aligned with truth and principle. So to keep us in there, you know, to keep us in prison, to keep us enslaved, they need to distract us and keep us looking outward. That's exactly what their trick is. They keep us, they keep our eyes outward focused. That's why astrotheological religion the, is very focused on the exoteric, the external manifestations, rather than on the internal manifestations. So the more they can keep us focused on what's going on around us, the less we pay attention to what's going on in the inner world within us. Now, to help you to start bringing that back in alignment, I have created a homework assignment. This is going to seem a little bit similar to other assignments because there is some overlap, but I wanna invite you to go through it because even if it is somewhat similar to the other assignments, 
when done properly, you're going to still get a lot out of this. So again, set aside some time. I recommend at least an hour when you're not likely to be interrupted. Have a pen and paper handy. Now this exercise will be even more powerful if you can sit in front of a mirror where you can look at yourself in the mirror. This will be difficult for some of you. You may find this difficult, especially if you're not used to doing this, but I would encourage you to do it despite the discomfort because that's where the real growth is. Spend some time with yourself and begin to make observations about yourself, not just about how you look, you can also cover how you look if you want to touch on that. But I want you to really pay attention to the manifestation of your personality, the way you behave, the, the beliefs, the operating system of you. Anything that's worthy of consideration, anything that comes to mind. And you'll know what you need to pay attention to because it will come to you. So write that down. These may be some things that you think that you may have already deemed worthy of consideration, worthy of changing in some way. You may have already brought some conscious awareness to it, but you haven't really tackled it. Again, you'll know when it's right for you. And what I want you to do is I want you to write out a plan of action tailored to you for the next seven days where you're going to take specific actions to begin to modify your behaviors. You're gonna to begin to make those changes to you, to yourself, even small ones, even if you're only focusing on one thing at a time, perfectly okay. As the old expression goes, Rome was not built in a day. Whatever was right for you to tackle first, go for that. And then based on the success of that endeavor, you can always come back to this exercise and focus on something else. Make it achievable for you. And then for the following week after making that commitment, every day I want you to spend some time with yourself and review how you've done. Don't beat yourself up if you didn't make as much progress as you wanted to. And obviously praise and reward yourself if you did. Uh, but just make adjustments to go. If you need to adjust your plan so that you can achieve it, go for it. And just be grateful for the progress. Be grateful for the gift of even being able to redesign yourself and your life and just see where that takes you. And as always, with all these exercises, I want to invite you to come back after you've done it and comment on this video, wherever you're watching this, just to share your experience with everyone else. I'd love to hear how this went for you. And I'd love to be able to provide any feedback if you get stuck. So come back and share your experience with the exercise. And having said all that, we now come to the fifth characteristic of human nature that we're going to cover today and that is conscience or what can also be thought of as the inner standing the internal recognition and knowing of morality if you've already been following my work and if you've already been initiated into occult knowledge in the past you will certainly have already come to understand that morality is objective however for anyone for whom this is a new concept I want to provide a brief review here because it is important. Objective morality is very simple. Right and wrong, which apply to behaviors, apply to what we can do, the difference between right and wrong is inherent in nature. It is natural. It is not man-made. It is not a mental construct. It actually exists in reality. And it's very easy to understand the difference because what is wrong is simply the theft of rightful property. It's the theft of that which does not belong to you, which rightfully belongs to someone else. And that can include their life, their rights, and their physical property. So the good news is that to be moral means all we have to do is not steal that which does not belong to us. Other than that, we can, we can we may take any other action and, and that will be considered moral as long as we don't either steal that which doesn't belong to us or condone such behavior in others. So really, on, the only kind of action that can ever be considered right and moral is that which is done voluntarily, not under the threat of violence or coercion. 
you've almost certainly heard about the seven deadly sins from the Christian, certain tr Christian traditions. Well, as it turns out, there is actually a true seven deadly sins or transgressions of natural law, and they are murder, the theft of life, assault, which is the theft of well-being and freedom, rape, which is the theft of free will of choice of sexual association, theft of physical property, trespassing, which is the theft of privacy and security in one's own abode, coercion, which is the theft of free will, and willful lying, which is theft of knowledge of the truth required to make the right choice. These seven behaviors are always wrong. They are always immoral at all times and places for eternity and ubiquitously. And we as human beings, part of being human, we're capable of understanding that. Not only intellectually, again, going back to holistic intelligence, not only intellectually, but holistically, intuitively, common sense, emotionally. We feel this in our emotions. So since we have this capacity to understand deeply the difference between right and wrong, a consequence of that in natural law is that we are, in fact, always 100% responsible for the consequences of all of our actions and behaviors, all of them. And conscience, in fact, is simply the inner standing, the understanding within of objective morality. Acting morally, however, externalizing that, putting it into practice, requires holistic intelligence, free will, self-reflection, and conscience. It requires all of those things. We bring them together and now we can act and behave morally. When we act and behave morally, for the most part, because no one is perfect, no one's gonna get it right all of the time. I understand that. The point is to do the best we can. But when we largely, in the majority, for the most part, behave morally, this has great, great positive consequences, not just for us individually, but actually perhaps even more importantly for all of us together as humanity, as a species. And this is what largely informs the, the body of my work and a large part of why I teach and why I do what I do. So what are these amazing benefits that we unlock as a result of being moral and acting morally? Well, we unlock freedom. Freedom is what it's all about. Physical freedom, mental freedom, spiritual freedom. That freedom allows us to, to actualize our infinite value as human beings, and it allows us to learn, grow, and evolve more quickly, even as we make mistakes, even as we sometimes get it wrong. It allows us to unlock and access higher levels of creativity and problem solving. It allows us to experience more joy in life, more peace, more happiness, and more satisfaction. It allows us to reduce chronic anxiety, depression, fear, sadness, and shame. And it allows us to create literally paradise on earth. And again, this is a main motivating factor for why I do what I do. I want to help you and us together and all of us to be able to literally unlock paradise. And we can do that as we gain a better understanding, a better applied understanding of conscience and of all of these aspects of what makes us a human. Now, the dark occultists, the reason why they have been successful in literally leading us to co-create a world, a civilization based on violence and coercion, which is institutionalized, is among other things because they have sown utter confusion about morality, about what morality actually is, and the fact that it is even objective in our mind. This is what they've done. And in fact, 
in many ways they have actually inverted morality so that we think it means the opposite of what it actually means. And this is the subversion of conscience. How is this done and what are the effects of it? Well, in order to achieve this, there needs to be a mental imbalance. And what they have led people to do is to focus heavily on ego gratification, feeling good, pursuit of pleasure, gain without even at the expense of others. You've heard the expression dog. It's a dog eat dog world. Whoever you've got to step on the corporate ladder, climbing the ladder, doing whatever it takes to get ahead. These are all basically aspects of the ego driven mindset. They've also instilled through programming the belief that morality is in fact subjective, that it's relative. We get to make it up. Right and wrong, it's whatever you get away with. It's whatever each person thinks. Literally, more than half of humanity thinks this way. And you may be someone who thinks this way too. Here's your opportunity to understand the consequences of this thinking. So when the mind slash brain is out of balance, as we've seen earlier, conscience is impossible because conscience is the holistic understanding of morality, which requires both the left brain and right brain intelligence. So when there is an imbalance, you can't get there because you're not going to be able to understand morality solely through intellect. And you're not going to be able to understand morality solely through intuition. There needs to be a combination of both. There is also a lot in pop culture, there's a lot of uh, inversion of what it actually means to be moral. So for example, many people think that homosexuality is immoral. They think that just having sexual desires is immoral, as is greed. Think of the seven deadly sins of the Christian traditions. And this is all false. Now, some types of behavior can be vices and they can lead someone down a certain path. But the behaviors in themselves are not immoral. Homosexuality is definitely not immoral. It is a choice that as long as it's made between consenting adults, adults who are mature enough to make the choice and they are consenting through their own free will, then there's nothing immoral about it. You may not like it. You may even be disgusted by it, but that doesn't make it immoral. It's simply a matter of choice. As long as it is moral based on the objective definition of morality. Even worse, far worse than that, is this idea that somehow someone by donning a uniform and then claiming to be a police officer or some member of law enforcement, that just by putting on, just by being a member of a certain organization and wearing a certain uniform, they now have the right to commit murder. They now have the right to commit assault. They have the right to commit theft. And they will continue to do that as long as we think that that is moral and acceptable. That's how perverse the understanding of morality has become in society, that we literally think that some people have the right to get away with murder. Just think about that. Think about that for a minute. Subversion of conscience can also lead and actually, I think necessarily must lead to some suppression of the emotions that we need to feel in order to know holistically the difference between right and wrong. I'm referring, of course, to emotions like shame, remorse, regret, empathy, compassion, understanding, fear, and so forth. Although the person may not have been born a psychopath, as we talked about, they become psychopathic by suppressing these emotions and then they have no chance of grasping morality, no chance of having a conscience, at least not holistically and entirely. They may have a conscience about certain things and in certain circumstances, but it's not going to be holistic. So what is the price of moral relativism? What is the price that we pay as a civilization, as humanity? Well, probably the most 
obvious consequence of that is we literally live on in a world where violence is institutionalized murder assault theft trespassing kidnapping coercion deception these are actually condoned it's not just that they're happening but they are condoned they are allowed to happen they're sanctioned they're they're ordained we comply with them and of course i'm referring to the institutions the police the military law enforcement the judicial system in any country the government of any country any type of government the mainstream media which is also complicit through its propaganda through the programming public education which as i mentioned is nothing of the kind it is public indoctrination it's indoctrination to keep people in their left brain and to indoctrinate them to obey authority the end that's the purpose of public education we actually end up policing each other as a result of it the police come from us they they are human beings like you and i they come out of the same ranks and so we actually end up policing each other we enslave each other we take we attempt to take away each other's rights so we have as i said a society that's built on violence children are and here's an interesting one children are actually treated as property or a burden imagine that people thinking that children are their property how perverted is that not to mention destruction of the natural world and the environment around us and i'll tell you what as a species as humanity there are no guarantees that we're going to make it and we definitely stand no chance of being free as a species as humanity as long as moral relativism continues to be the belief the programming of most people and frankly i don't even think there's i think we could go extinct as a species as a result of that but it doesn't have to be that way that's why i'm sharing this knowledge with you it doesn't have to be that way it's not inevitable but it it will be inevitable as long as we continue down the path that we're on that much is true let me talk a little bit about the role of conscience in my own life i was someone who conducted wrong behaviors many many times in my life and even when i was doing it deep inside because i was not born a psychopath i knew that i was doing the wrong thing there were many times when i knew and i even had more of a conscious awareness but i was lying to myself and i never had that cultivation again going back to what i shared earlier i never had parents who helped me to cultivate conscience who helped to guide me and teach me in order to nurture and reinforce that inner knowing and i was someone that i it was all about chasing the pleasures instant gratification me 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 whatever is good for me even if i have to hurt somebody in the process and i might feel bad about getting caught or you know the consequences because i did feel them but i would just write it off i would say oh it's just it's just the price i have to pay i would diminish it and devalue that of course there are consequences and over time i began to suffer more and more as i've shared already and this suffering actually reached a point where it became practically unbearable and that's where i was faced with what i like to call that critical moment of choice that choice that many of us get to get to face at some point in our lives and you can never be sure when it is and for you that might be right now or you may have already reached that moment or it may still be ahead of you but it's that critical moment where we get to decide am i really going to continue to be this way or am i going to gain a better understanding am i going to start to recognize the difference between right and wrong all around me and in my own behavior am i going to begin to recognize the difference between reality and illusion all around me and within me we get to choose it's always a choice the homework assignment 
for this one is already on my website. It's called the seven day mental freedom challenge. This is a challenge that I cultivated based on conversations I had with some friends while I've been traveling. And it's the perfect exercise to help you understand not only conscience, but also many, or if not all of the prior characteristics that we've talked about so far in this presentation. So I want to invite you to surf to my website, go to the section where it says Freedom Vibe Academy or Academy and look for the seven day mental freedom challenge and that will guide you moving forward. And now we come to the final trait, the final aspect of human nature that we're going to consider in this presentation and that is creativity and the imagination. And I'm sure you'll agree this is probably the one that is most likely to put a smile on your face, uh, the one that's most likely to be considered a bit fun, a bit enjoyable, and it's, although perhaps we can approach it with a little more lightheartedness, it's no less important than any of the others. So what is creativity? Creativity is inherent. It exists at every level of creation. And what it is essentially is we transform, we alchemize our thoughts and we emotionalize them. And then we go to work in the world and we create things, physical forms, but also mental forms and other thought forms and digital forms as well. And we do that through applying our will and tapping into imagination. And in fact, all creativity is essentially an act of love. When I say love, I don't mean, I'm not referring to romantic love, I'm referring to agape or the love of creation, the love of existence. And it's nearly the greatest thing we can do. And it, it, it does require some level of courage and desire to move beyond where we are now, to create things that are greater than already exists. Diving a little more to creativity from an occult perspective, the principle of mentalism, which is the first hermetic principle, basically states that the all is mind, the universe is mental. So one way to think about this is that we are essentially, we exist in the mind or the imagination of the creator of all, of everything that exists. And the universe that we live in is essentially like one big mental construct that within it, we as beings with mind can also create other mental constructs. And that leads us to the second hermetic principle, which is the principle of correspondence, which states as above, so below, as within, as without. So our creation, our desire to create, our ability to create, is almost like a mirror, a reflection of creation itself. We have that innate desire because through our creativity, God or the creator or creation itself comes to know itself. So we are an active participant in that process. And it's really just amazing when you contemplate it at that level. And imagination, which is our ability to tap into that realm that field of infinite possibility, it has no limits. Imagination, pure imagination is unlimited, it's unbounded. We can literally create from infinite possibility. Creativity is also dimensional. What that means is as we create, as we evolve and create more, we unlock higher and higher levels of creation. So it's an evolutionary process. And of course, some destruction is required to allow us to unfold because we always have, there's always going to be both. So in some cases we will destroy or take away in order to further create. So what are some of the ways that creativity manifests? Well, it manifests through language and communication, the different ways that we communicate, whether verbally or otherwise. All the works of art, fine art, music, poetry, song, 
theater, film, and more. These are all the different ways that we express our creativity. I've already mentioned earlier how I, this year, embraced creativity by becoming a singer and songwriter. And if you want to check out my songs, I'll provide a link or you can go to my website, you'll find them there, or my YouTube channel. But the point is that I was enabling, I was activating further my creative abilities. I was basically actualizing my creative ability further by taking on that creative ability. And you could do the same, whether through song or through any other medium. We all have that capacity, right? And it it really brings a higher level of beauty to life when we embrace that. Creativity is both structural. It has a left brain aspect to it, like a structural kind of rational level. And it also has that fluid, more feminine, more right brain aspect to it. So that's why creativity entails, for example, architecture, which can both be aesthetic, but also functional. It has both in it. We can create systems and processes, which is kind of the virtual world, the digital world, the, that may not have a physical representation in the way that we construct buildings, but it, it has a digital representation. We can create in the realm of food and, and agriculture, even in the realm of education, even this presentation that I've created to teach this important knowledge to you is a work of art. It's a creation. It's something that I've put a lot of effort into and that I've designed, I've thought about it, both structurally but also aesthetically. So this is education materials like this one are also examples of being creative. Unfortunately, we are experiencing a phenomenon which I would call the death of the imagination. And this is, again, something that is part of the ideology of the dark occultists because they know that the more that we can tap into our imagination as human beings, the more that we be, are creative, then the more they lose their ability to control us because creativity is not controlled except through a conscious decision to wield the, the pen or the paintbrush or the musical instrument in a certain way. But that comes from the freedom to do that, not from a, an external control. So in order to propagate their society of violence, they need to destroy our ability to tap into the imagination. And this is where the idea of false scarcity comes in as a belief, or this notion that things will never change. They'll always be this way just a literally an inability to imagine that things could that we could actually live in a world where there is more freedom and more peace and many people sadly think this way many people believe this way through a death of the imagination and through being cut off from their inner creativity another expression only death and taxes are certain i mean how low how much of a low view of yourself and reality do you have to have to really believe that? This also goes back to that idea of conflating the current human condition with human nature. So we imagine, we think that there, you know, there is no way we could get ourselves out of the situation we find ourselves in. It's inevitable. It has to be this way. Death of the imagination. And of course, because imagination is core and central to who we are as human beings and creativity is a core part of our purpose and for being and even for even existing when we are cut off from this we start to experience again depression anxiety sadness even feelings of suicide as we're put more and more into a box and this is the manifestation of the death of the imagination so as i mentioned this is a fun one and the homework assignment should certainly be fun and enjoyable even compared to the other homework assignments. And the homework assignment is very simple. I based it on my own uh, desire and, and my own actions to become a singer-songwriter. So I wanna invite you to sit down and pick a skill, a craft, an art, a, an activity, a creative activity, something that you haven't done before, but something that 
you have likely considered or expressed some desire or some interest to do it, maybe even a large interest or desire. Could be anything at all. Writing a story, painting, drawing, composing a song, singing, any activity at all, anything that involves creativity. Don't limit yourself on this. You may want to even choose something specifically that you've kind of had a closet, you know, a hidden desire to do maybe even your entire life and you never really acted on. But obviously make it something that's feasible. Make it something that you know you could take a reasonable stab at, that you know that you have a chance to do it. It is feasible. It is within your means as long as you make an effort. And then I want you to commit to at least a week, at least, at least seven days and take action even if it's signing up for a class, even if it's just practicing, whatever it is, I want you to take specific action to take on this creative endeavor over the next seven days to the best of your ability. Really do the best that you can. And as you're going through this process, keep a journal. Every once in a while, maybe once a day or as often as you feel inspired, sit down and write out the experience of engaging in that activity. What came up to you? What were some of the thoughts and ideas? What did that unlock for you? What did that make possible for you? How did you feel as a result of going through that? How did you feel in the beginning? How did you feel after you were able to accomplish something? So really go deep into that and start to cultivate deeper levels of creativity and more tapping into imagination. Well, folks, if you made it this far, then you've joined me on the journey and we've been able to dive in deep to all six of these aspects of human nature. And so again, I wanna thank you for making it this far and let's kind of put this all together and see what we've been able to garner from this. And this is my proposal as it were, this is maybe more my opinion in my perspective. And I want to invite you to kind of cultivate your own perspective on this. So would you not agree that even in the process of acquiring this knowledge, even as you just start to put it into practice, that you already are, have become and are becoming a better version of yourself? Would you not agree with that? Would you not agree that you now have access to knowledge and understanding that's going to allow you to get more out of life, even within your own sphere and domain of influence? Would you not agree that as more people gain this knowledge and understanding that we have a real chance together to unlock freedom, to unlock true peace, to unlock more harmony in the world that we share together? Would you not agree that now you are in a better position to protect and defend your mind, your property, your own mind, more effectively, to basically be the master of your dominion, to be sovereign, to protect yourself from external threats, including threats and attempts to control your mind and limit you as a human being. What is that lyric from the, the Who, the musical band The Who? Won't be fooled again. You can't unlearn this stuff, folks. You can't unlearn what, you, what we've learned today. Now you know where, whatever level you were able to acquire. And if you want to go back and watch this presentation, I highly encourage you to do that. But whatever you were able to get, gather from this, whatever you were, knowledge you were able to gain, you can't unlearn that. You're already in a better place. And now help me to help reach more people because together as more and more people start to gain and regain this knowledge, then we really have a chance to manifest a greater reality. So I hope this has been helpful. I've obviously put a lot of effort into this presentation. It's taken me a while, several months in fact, to get put this all together. So I would appreciate it if you could show some love. Definitely smash through the like button wherever you're watching this. That will help me to get this in front of more people. Comment below anything at all. Come back and comment after doing the homework or just leave a word of appreciation, share this video with everybody, please share this with everybody. And of course, subscribe or follow wherever you're watching this. And if you want to get involved even a little bit deeper in the conversation, 
I do have a Telegram channel and group. You'll find links below this and most of my videos where you can either subscribe to the channel. You can also join the group if you want to strike up a conversation with other like-minded students, other initiates, and that way we can start to create more of a community together. If you got a lot of value out of, it, out of this and you want to help me even more, consider leaving a tip or making a donation. Again, this is, this is work. This is work. It takes work to do this. It takes a lot of effort, time, and resources. So by leaving a tip, making a donation, you're really showing that you value this and you help me to keep going. And if you'd rather sponsor me, you can do like Jonathan did and become a sponsor of an upcoming video. I also appreciate that. I'll provide my website link in a minute. You can find all this information on the website. I do also offer certain services to help others do what I do, which is to share important knowledge with a larger audience, mainly through video content. So if you want to explore those services, you're going to find them on my website as well. So freedomvibe.art is the academy that I have created. It's a private educational platform where I have committed to teaching natural law and occult knowledge, just like you learned in today's presentation. So you'll find out more information about the academy on my website as well. And here's all my contact information. If you want to reach out, bookmark the website freedomvibe.art. That's freedomvibe.art. You can also email me, david at freedomvibe.art. Please do not add me to any mailing lists without my consent. However, feel free to reach out for any reason. There are no taboo topics, so feel free to reach out to me, anything at all. You can also reach me by a WhatsApp or text at the number listed on the screen. And if you prefer Telegram, again, I do have a Telegram account, so you can reach me on Telegram as well. And having said all that, thank you so much for your time and attention. I appreciate you. And I look forward to seeing you again very soon.